Welcome to the webinar recording with the title Treating All Crisis Situations the Same Way The Solution is a Tiered Crisis Model In this webinar we provide insights on tiered crisis models We will be talking about different models, trigger points and assessment guides Good afternoon everybody and thank you for joining me in today's session. So we are here for the fifth webinar in the series of seven, where on this time we will be talking about the tiered crisis model and the uh, title for the program today is uh, treating all crisis situations the same way. The question mark, the solution is a tiered crisis model. Um, so uh, that's what we're going to focus on. The session today is scheduled to last for 45 minutes, and uh, that will include my presentation, which is going to be around 25 minutes, and then there will be time for questions afterwards. So I hope you have a lot of those. Let me just start by making myself a bit smaller and uh, put the presentation more in focus. That's it. And then uh, let's move to uh, some of the practical details. Since this is a webinar broadcast, then you are all muted by default and the dialogue is uh, via questions. So you can use the ask a question button in the bottom of the screen uh, to ask your questions and uh, I will take them uh, towards the end. But feel free to ask the questions as we go along when something pops up. Uh, and then we use the chat uh, part uh, as the uh, uh, part for technical issues. Um, if you want to see the webinar afterwards, you can go to my YouTube channel uh, uh, a few hours after the session and uh, look at it there. And uh, please also remember to subscribe to the channel. That will uh, give you uh, uh, updates when uh, new material is uploaded uh, to the YouTube channel in these days. So, let's uh, move on. Um, uh, some of you are familiar with me, some have uh, not met me before, but uh, I've been spending the last 30 plus years of uh, preparing for the unexpected, which is in principle what crisis management is about. I have done that in uh, both the maritime industry and in the telecom industry, and I have a background as a naval officer in the Royal Danish Navy. Um, some of the things that I've learned through all my positions is that uh, if you're not uh, properly prepared, then it's going to be very difficult to deal with crisis situations and therefore uh, preparation is the key. And, and I have also learned that uh, it is necessary in uh, crisis situations to understand the balance between commercial and, and uh, uh, operational uh, requirements or preferences. Uh, and I think that's also something that's typically overlooked when you look at uh, crisis management setups in various companies. They are typically very operational focused and maybe a little bit less uh, with a commercial uh, mindset as well. And I think it's important to understand here that when we talk enterprises, the reasons enterprises exist is to make business. Therefore, the customers are important. And uh, therefore, also the commercial view is uh, critical. So enough about that. Uh, the topics that I will cover today will be uh, a little bit about setting the scene. Then we'll talk about the purpose of a tiered crisis model. Uh, I'll uh, discuss a couple of common models or common ways of looking at uh, these prioritization models, which a tiered crisis model in principle is. And we're going to look into my preferred one, which is the pyramid uh, tiered model. We'll talk about the trigger points for the various uh, levels in a crisis model. And then uh, also some of the practical tools that will help your teams uh, easier assess what crisis level it is and therefore also how to uh, approach the crisis. So uh, all that we will be looking at in the coming uh, uh, 20 minutes. If you haven't seen this one before, that's then it's because you haven't heard me speaking before. 
because one of the key things to understand with crisis management is that there's a lot of value in doing it, both before, during, and after a crisis. And it's not just cost ads. If you ask a lot of CEOs, they will think that, uh, yeah, having a crisis set up, it's just expensive. And why should we spend money on it? Because we've never seen a crisis. And and I mean, there's, there's a whole list of arguments that you will typically come across. And uh, if you want to hear more about those arguments, so when you're about to sell it, uh, I think you should uh, either listen in next week when I talk about implementing a crisis uh, management system in an organization and some of the pitfalls you will get into there. Uh, that's uh, next Tuesday, uh, same time as today. Um, or you should try to use the uh, value argument. Uh, and here you can see that the, there's a lot of value you can create from the very activities that you do uh, when you prepare yourself for crisis. And it's not just when the crisis happens that you can extract value. Actually, just the fact that you're better prepared can already there uh, uh, produce value that you can argue to customers, you can argue to uh, banks, insurances, uh, et cetera, that uh, you actually have a setup that is uh, that is uh, well designed. And you have also taken uh, the necessarily uh, precautionary actions that you can to reduce the likelihood of crisis situations happening, or even if they happen, that uh, you have taken initiatives to reduce the impact uh, of them. Uh, and those arguments, uh, I think, is, is is pretty key. And then, of course, there's a lot of value during a crisis where you can be faster and more efficient. And uh, afterwards, you can get a better reputation. And you will also realize that you probably lost less money by doing it faster and more efficient, uh, and therefore also less impact to your customers. So how do you get it done? Well, um, to me, it's all in the preparation. It's all about how well prepared are you for crisis. And uh, that starts with an analysis of your risks, looking at critical functions, threats, and the consequences, and your current readiness. Based on that and the organizational setup that you have in your company, the industry you're in, the specifics of your company, you create a plan. And here it's not just a generic plan. You need to make one that is tailored specifically for your business uh, so that it fits the way that you operate. Um, and then you need to exercise it once it's implemented. And then it comes this repetitive circle of exercising, learning, and adjust. Hopefully, you never get into a crisis, but should you get into a crisis, then you can activate the plan, you act, and you communicate, and it is in that sequence. Uh, and then... When you can de-escalate and the crisis is over, you post-evaluate and you learn from it and you adjust your plans uh, and then it all starts over again. So uh, this model uh, is important to understand. But where we are today is uh, in the planning part, which is uh, the early part of the preparations. Uh, and uh, we have over the last couple of weeks uh, in my webinar series been covering some of the items here on, on the left-hand side, which is the risk evaluation and uh, the response plans, the overall crisis plan system. Last week, we talked about uh, organizational setups. Uh, and this week, we're talking about the tiered crisis model, which is a part that goes into the crisis plan uh, and is one of the cornerstones in how you uh, set it up uh, in your plan, how you organize around it, uh, how you activate, how you notify, uh, uh, et cetera, and, and also how you do escalations. So this is where we are today. Uh, and that will be the last topic uh, in this webinar series on the crisis plan system uh, before we next week uh, jump towards the implementation part. So uh, stay tuned for that. And as you can see, just here, we were on the crisis plan and we're here with the crisis levels, including the triggers. And uh, that will be the cornerstone to what we're talking about uh, today. So let's jump into it. So why should we have a tiered crisis model? Well, one of the key things that we want to achieve is we want to avoid that we do an overkill. Uh, I talked uh, uh, last week about uh, rubbernecking, where uh, when something happens, everybody's jumping on it and uh, everybody wants to be a part of it. And, and we can 
apply a little bit the same logic here uh, if we don't have a tiered model. If you don't have a tiered model where you can prioritize your efforts uh, based on the severity of a crisis, then you avoid you 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 run the risk of of putting too many resources, uh, too many people on it, and thereby do an overkill. That overkill uh, uh, remove the clarity of who's doing what. Uh, it 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 potentially. Uh, uh, gives you uh, extra costs uh, and, and complexity that you don't need. So we want to avoid the overkill. And if we can avoid the overkill, we can save resources by just having the right resources uh, uh, involved. We can save costs by not having so many, many people, or maybe not even uh, the, the, the big heavy response uh, that we potentially could have done if we haven't uh, evaluated the crisis. And then the most important part to me is that we can allow focus on non-effective business parts. And I talked about that when we talked organization as well, because it is super critical that if there's a, there's a crisis, there's a certain number of people who's dealing with the crisis and the rest of the organization, they focus on the non-effective business parts because you want to make sure that you serve that part as well. And the tiered model uh, will definitely help in, in doing this. We use the model to evaluate the incidents. So uh, with the evaluation, we also ensure that we activate the right plans, we get the right uh, response applied, and we bring the right competences to the table. So, so that's also what it helps with. And then, of course, it gives clarity on roles and responsibilities, because as you will see when we move into uh, the model that I like, then it's very clear on where, what level in the organization uh, you're actually dealing uh, with the crisis situation and, uh, and also uh, uh, what kind of response you do. And then I think actually also for uh, maybe less experienced teams or teams where crises are very rare, then having a tiered model uh, and the assessment process that comes with that is, is a super tool to evaluate or even detect a crisis because it, it asks some of these questions that will help you determine, hey, is there actually a potential uh, large crisis looming uh, in the horizon or is the combination of a lot of smaller events uh, something that uh, is a precursor for something uh, more serious? And I think uh, those of you who... Uh, know me have probably heard me talking about uh, this about uh, fast developing and slow developing crisis situations where the fast developing that's these big bang something happens an explosion or a fire or a kidnapping uh, then it's, uh, it's it's very clearly that you have a crisis at hand but the difficult ones that's the slowly developing ones where small signals here and there uh, on its own is not super serious but when you start thinking them through, or the combination of a couple of incidents uh, can actually uh, lead to a severe crisis. And typically, some of the more severe crises, they are actually starting off as slowly developing. Uh, excuse me for a second. <coughs> Where um, just the fact that you didn't uh, capture these uh, early warning signals uh, actually uh, drove it uh, towards a, a real crisis. So uh, that's important uh, to keep in mind. If you look at liquor literature on crisis models, there's, uh, there's many different models that you can actually apply uh, uh, and, and being used. And they have different purposes. They serve uh, uh, different types of organizations, etc. But But I think what is quite common is that uh, they are typically uh, invented by either military or first responders or combination thereof. Uh, and it is used as a way of categorizing um, and prioritizing incidents and how you organize around them. Um, so uh, you, you evaluate an event based on a set of criteria. That's typically what the most of these uh, tiered models they do. Then you pair them with a guide on uh, the response level. Uh, the, so the response level is is, uh, is is basically the tiers. And then you pair it with a command structure. And, and you can see models that is without a command structure or is only a command structure, or you can see combinations of them. Uh, the two most common ones that, that, uh, that I think uh, most other uh, setups they, uh, they build upon is a uh, the the American uh, model, which is called the National Incident Management System, or NIMS, 
uh, which build on different incident types. And if you look at the figure on the right hand side, the top one, you can see that they have uh, five uh, types of incidents. And then it's paired with an incident command system or ICS, where type uh, five, four and, and party three are dealt with by local resources, uh, two and part of two and part of three by state support to local jurisdictions and then type one is national support to state and local jurisdictions so you can see there's also kind of an escalation in in responsibility uh, up in the national organization in this model when you move up to the bigger or more severe uh, types of incidents um, in the uk and particularly in uh, uh, the national response so uh, uh, first responders, uh, firefighters, uh, linked to Coast Guard and military and things like that. They use uh, uh, a command structure that is building on a, on a gold, silver and bronze level, where uh, gold is the strategic level or, or the senior management uh, part that sets the strategy. The silver level is the uh, what we could probably match in, in a corporate company, uh, the supervisors or the managers, they are the ones that makes it happen. And then you have the bronze level, which is the operational level, that uh, is the frontline staff that carries out the task. And, and particularly in the UK, there was a there was a, an, a, a good example of how that was deployed uh, a couple of years ago when there was all these uh, massive uh, uh, floodings in, in the central parts of the UK uh, following uh, quite significant rainfalls where they had uh, the gold uh, uh, level were on a ministerial level, uh, the silver level was on, on a regional level, and the bronze level was the local firefighters uh, uh, and first responders uh, that was there. In this case, uh, and the UK model is, is, is not always linked to different crisis types, but it's more command structure that is put in uh, on top of the way that they work, and it's being used mostly to to steer uh, organizations where you have a lot of complexity, you have a lot of different entities that are involved and uh, uh, decisions are taken on, on different levels. So you can think of it a little bit like a uh, of an escalation uh, way of thinking uh, as well. And, and you will see when we look at the pyramid model that uh, it's maybe building a little bit on, uh, on the UK model as well. We don't call it operational, tactical, or strategic, or strategic levels, but uh, the thinking of, of, of where in the organization uh, uh, it is controlled uh, stems a little bit from this one, but we've also paired it with uh, the incident types. So, so the type that I uh, prefer is, uh, is actually a, a, a pyramid model uh, because I think it's simple. And, uh, and and that's the one that I think is most suitable for um, for for commercial enterprises. Uh, matrix models could probably also work. Uh, I think there's different ways how you draw it, but uh, but I think it's important that uh, it's uh, it's it's kept simple. So the pyramid uh, crisis model, which is the one that I always uh, encourage people to use. Uh, is, uh, is the, I think, the most simple one. And I, I like to have one which uh, is just a three level, uh, because if you have too many levels, it's also becoming a little bit too complicated to determine, uh, is it one or two, or is it uh, two or three, or is it three or four, where should it be? So I think if you just have three, it's uh, it's gonna be uh, a lot easier to, to draw the line between what is the level one, what is the level two, and what is the level three. And, uh, and and I think the size of the pyramid also should indicate that uh, you will have most incidents that are on level one, a little bit less than on level two, and you will have very few that are on level three, because the severity increases as you go up uh, uh, in the pyramid, uh, and that so does the response resp responsibility. And when I think re response responsibility here is that where in the corporate organization does it go? And I mean, if you are just a small, medium-sized company with just um, just a few, uh, let's say a hundred people, then uh, and just one location, then maybe a, a a model like this is 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 a little bit of an overkill, at least on a response responsibility level. But it's still good from a severity and uh, and. Uh, and response plan point of view, whereas if you are at a more complex organization like, let's say, Carlsberg or 
or Maersk or similar like that, where you have uh, offices abroad, you have different factories, et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's actually pretty good to have uh, both the response, responsibility, the type of response and the severity levels uh, incorporated in this one. Uh, because what you want to achieve with the period model is that you want as much of the responsibility being pushed down in your in the organization because that's of course where you have the biggest capacity to deal with it so you have you can deal with more incidents on a, on a level one than you can on a, on a level three because you typically only have one global crisis team that can uh, that can deal with uh, with the situations on, on the high level uh, so so you want to make sure it's pushed down uh, and that's uh, that's uh, super important. But if you're in doubt, of course, with any crisis, and you do the evaluation, if you're in doubt where it is, then it's better to start high and then de-escalate uh, and 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 push it down in the organization than it is to uh, go uh, the other way around. So, uh, so I think that's important to think about. Well, one thing is having the model. The key point to this is actually to define what triggers. Uh, uh, the each level of this and uh, we use trigger points as criteria for each level uh, and and you can apply some generic ones and typically if you are a uh, commercial enterprise then uh, what really is generic trigger points is impact on staff impact on critical operation or critical production it could be impact on revenue impact on costs impact on reputation and then actually just the sheer scale of it could also determine that whether it's a it's a it's a level one two and three uh, but it needs to be specifically designed to your company specifically designed to your industry and it needs to build on your risk assessment right because we're, we're coming back to the risk assessment that we did uh, some weeks back where you have uh, identified your risk matrix uh, you have uh, uh, mapped out what are the very serious incidents that has a huge, typically a huge cost impact because you converted everything into cost. Uh, uh, so, so the bigger ones should definitely be level three incidents, whereas uh, level two and level one, uh, as it fits there. There, you can't draw a direct line between the risk matrix and and the uh, pyramid here, but you should keep it in mind when you start looking at the various uh, trigger points. Because remember, in the in the risk matrix, we, we talked about a money value uh, on incidents, whereas here we're now looking at, at different aspects like staff, critical operation, revenue, cost, reputation, uh, etc. But if you take the generic examples and, and try to spell out what that does, what does that mean? When then as an example, then level three incidents, that could be something like fatalities. Uh, in my in my book and uh, the way that I operate, then if there's a fatality in the organization, uh, work-related fatality either for an employee or a contractor etc it is by default at level three this is something that needs to be up on on the highest level and attended to it doesn't necessarily mean that it turns into a massive crisis but just the fact that you're losing lives should uh, bring it up to a level three uh, and then i use these terms of significant financial or property risk uh, major reputational risk or an extreme or out of the ordinary risk because we need to also understand here that that we we have in our risk assessment mapped up all the likely things that could happen to us uh, but there will be some out of the ordinary risk as well and they will typically be of a larger nature if we haven't thought about it they're typically out of a out of the ordinary uh, and therefore they will typically also be on a level three um, Level two, that could be, again, pending on organization. It could be missing or arrested or injured or war-trapped employees or contractors. And remember, if you have contractors, when they work for you, you actually also have a responsibility for them. And there's a lot of companies who think that, oh, it's a contractor. They have their own setup. But I in my book, if they work for you, uh, you also need to think about it. Because if something happens to them, it will eventually come back to you uh, and uh, and and potentially hit you as well uh, if you're not uh, careful uh, in that and then we come from major uh, or significant financial risk we come down to moderate financial risk uh, etc and then when we come down to level one it's minor financial impact or, or very limited reputation impact and by that we can actually also move it from uh, in what we have in the previous slide where we had the, the global uh, level we had local and we have functional, right? So local level could be uh, the country manager or 
or a site manager, etc., who has a functional responsibility that could be the uh, the, the head of IT, if it's an IT-related one, or it could be uh, the production manager, or it could be a warehouse manager, uh, or, or something like that, uh, that is in charge of uh, the responses. And of course, the response plan should also mirror this. Uh, so when you make response plans uh, for incidents that could have different severities, uh, you also need to specify it out in your uh, response plans exactly when well, if if let's say it's a flooding, if a flooding happens and it only has this impact, then it is a level one. But if it has this level, level of flooding, it's a level two impact uh, or a level three and so on. So uh, so that's good to uh, to keep in mind. I tried to make an example of how this, this could look uh, and uh, just uh, typically looking at uh, staff assets operations. Operations could also be read as production uh, and reputation because that's typically the areas that uh, that you would like to look at. Uh, and, and with assets, uh, you could also uh, put in financials because that's really what it converts to. But, but the financial part of a... A, a tiered crisis model is is typically more a consequence uh, of some of the other incidents, so that's why I don't have uh, finance in here. But you could make one uh, that is uh, that is uh, different than this one. But but this is what I think uh, would typically for many corporates uh, be the facts. So staff assets, operations, and uh, reputation. And in here you can see some examples of level three, two, one, one. So let's take the the assets part. That could be an, an example here. And I think it's important to try to put more words on it than just say, okay, it's a it's a it's a it's a large incident. But but what does a large incident mean here? So here it could be a fire or similar in a building or a large mechanical failure. You could even maybe go down to say, okay, if this critical piece of machinery that we use in our production if that has a large mechanical failure that uh, uh, renders it inoperative for X number of days, then that is a critical asset that now is uh, uh, jeopardized, that has a huge consequences on something else, and that's why it's a, it's a level three uh, incident. Uh, it could also be uh, assets that are arrested, uh, or if you have caused a, a, an incident on, on third parties uh, by uh, using some of your tools, uh, etc. Uh, if you look at the uh, operations, it could be cyber attacks. Cyber attacks would typically be uh, uh, level three incidents. Uh, could also be war or warlike uh, situations in your operation area uh, or larger pollution incidents. Um, when you come down on level two, and if you take uh, here my example, you could say, okay, we had cyber attacks was level three. So IT system outages of less than maybe 48 hours, uh, that could be a level two. And if you take a level one, that could be uh, IT system outages of less than 12 hours, as an example. That's a that's a way of ranking. So the smaller incidents, that's a level one. And underneath that is, of course, uh, the, an, an, an IT uh, ticket uh, system as well. And then the more severe they get. So I think if you if you use these uh, uh, real examples and, and try to spell it out right, because you need to think about that uh, this... Um, cheering of the incidents is something that people need to look at at a time when a crisis happens right so it needs to be it needs to be easy to understand and you need to translate it uh, to people so the people that don't look at it every single day they have a good and easy way to understand okay what does it mean so this happened where does it fit in okay is there any concrete examples uh, of something here so okay it's a fire Okay, I understand. Fire. Okay, there's fire there. Assets level three. Okay, it's probably a level three. I will notify based on a level three incident, and then uh, uh, the process will be running. And then when you get the notification done and you do the assessment before you do the activation, then you can confirm that or you can actually uh, say, ah, no, maybe it's only level two, and then you activate uh, according to that. But, but it's important to spell it out uh, uh, as you go along. And one of the tools that you can help use to help uh, your staff uh, assessing is uh, is an assessment guide. And of course, you cannot make an assessment guide that has uh, 20,000 uh, questions uh, before it guides you down to a very specific detail. So this needs to be lifted up on a, on a, on a slightly uh, more uh, aggregated level. But in combination with your catalog of scenarios that you 
that you just saw before, which again is based back on your risk assessment. Uh, you can actually, with a combination of those two, uh, make a very good evaluations uh, uh, and determine who to notify and how to respond uh, to a specific uh, crisis because that will give you an idea of the crisis level. So take the example here of uh, of, uh, of the illustration on the right-hand side, which is a simple one. So is there fatalities of employees? Yes or no? If it's yes, okay, level three. If it's no, then the next question is there financial or property risks? Again, that's maybe a no. Is there major reputational risk? That's maybe also a no. Uh, but are we missing employees or contractors? Yes, we are. Okay, we're level two, right? And then you, if you compare that, uh, if you pair that with examples, uh, you have a a pretty good tool uh, that you can use uh, for um, for doing the assessment. And remember, this is the assessment that is done uh, by people in the front line that are looking at an incident and 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 needs to do the notification. And if they're in doubt, of course, they should always just call your uh, central notification number, but it might not need to go to that. It could actually be dealt with functional or locally if they've done the uh, assessment. So there's also an educational process in this, and that's also something that we will talk more about in the next week's session on, on the implementation part, but also in the session two weeks from now where we talk about training and exercise and how do you bring people up to speed so that they uh, they know this one. And, and I see a lot of companies where just this process of assessing an incident and determining uh, what kind of response and what kind of responsibility uh, should be placed around it uh, is something that is typically overlooked. And it's typically overlooked because everybody's treating uh, all crisis situations the same and they don't have a system in place uh, to categorize them and rank them uh, so that you use the efforts required but you don't overkill it. So I think that's uh, that's the key essential of uh, tiered uh, crisis models. It's something you make early in the process after you've done the risk assessment, but before you start designing the whole uh, crisis uh, management uh, system, because it impacts organization, it impacts uh, plans, uh, et cetera, uh, and your notification process, your activation process, et cetera. So, uh, so an important part. And it's also something that you need to get buy-in from, uh, from your management team. So to sum up for what we talked about today on uh, the uh, tiered crisis models, then purposes here, avoid overkill, evaluate incidents, clarify roles and responsibility, and then apply the right response. Uh, that's the key. Um, the tiered pyramid model is, is the one that I think is suitable for enterprises because it's simple, uh, but it needs to have defined trigger points for each level. And you can use these uh, five uh, points of staff, critical operation or production, revenue, cost and reputation as the guidelines for the trigger uh, points that you need to specify for your uh, uh, specific company, your specific industry so that it fits, right? And then you can make these concrete examples uh, for each level. Um, when I created the, uh, the crisis plan for, for, for Merce Klein, we actually had uh, very, very detailed examples of what would constitute a level one, two, and three. And we had actually, uh, we had five uh, categories. So we, we had staff, we had ships, we had uh, operational execution, we had customers, and we had some uh, reputation part. Uh, but, but you can make those uh, uh, as you as you see fit, uh, so that it fits uh, your particular business. So that is what I wanted to cover today uh, on the topic of uh, tiered crisis models. I hope you found it uh, interesting and and useful and relevant, and and maybe even gave you some uh, thoughts. Uh, it's often overlooked, uh, uh, but I think there's a lot of potential by applying it, and and it gives a good structure, and and it also forces you to do a good uh, uh, thinking before you design your crisis management setup. If you want to hear more, then uh, absolutely feel free to contact me. You can see all the details there. We're also on LinkedIn, YouTube, uh, Facebook, and Twitter. And then next week's seminar, uh, that's going to be about how you implement a crisis system that sticks, where we talk about the implementations, uh, learnings from uh, recent implementations I've been doing. 
uh, the invite will come out on LinkedIn in a couple of hours and uh, uh, with reminders during the week. So please remember to sign up uh, for that. Uh, that's going to be uh, an, an interesting session as well. And if you want to see this one again, then uh, hopefully within a couple of hours, uh, you'll be able to see it on YouTube or alternatively log into uh, the uh, uh, the webinar uh, system again uh, for this session, and you will be able to uh, see the uh, recording. With that, uh, I'll open up for questions. So uh, please pop your questions in the ask a question uh, button uh, in the bottom of the screen. There don't seem to be any uh, questions here. Uh, so I will uh, finish off for today. And uh, then I wish you a fantastic day. And uh, I hope to see you back in uh, next week's uh, session.